Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson, shooting today in Fiesole, a town in the hills above Florence, Italy. With me today, three guests. David Berlinski is a philosopher, mathematician, and author who has lived in Paris for a couple of decades now and is now the editor of Inference, the International Review of Science. David Galarenter is a professor of computer science at Yale and the author of a number of books, including most recently, The Tides of Mind, Uncovering the Spectrum of Consciousness. Stephen Meyer is a philosopher and author. He directs the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute, a think tank in Seattle. Here's what brings us together. In the Claremont Review of Books this past spring, David Galarenter published an essay titled, Giving Up Darwin. Quote, Stephen Meyer's thoughtful and meticulous book, Darwin's Doubt, convinced me that Darwin has failed. The Deniable Darwin and Other Essays, a book by David Berlinski, is also, quote, essential. David Galarenter, David Berlinski, Stephen Meyer, welcome. Thank you. All right, Thank you. definitions. Uh, Darwin's book is on the origin of species, and to quote from David Galarenter's essay, quote, there's no reason to doubt that Darwin su successfully explained the small adjustments by which an organism adapts to local circumstances, changes to fur density, or wing style, or beak shape. Yet there are many reasons to doubt whether he can explain the big picture, not the fine tuning of existing species, but the emergence of new ones, close quote. Okay, I'm a layman, I know nothing. Start by convincing me, somebody, that you're not just defining the term species to Darwin's disadvantage. Who wants to take that one, David? Um, there really is very little disagreement on the issue of what a species is, and I think it doesn't have to be a technical term. Mm -hmm. I think virtually any uh, alert child knows when he passes from one species of, uh, of pet creature to another species or what Dog, he cat. Yeah, a cow or a sheep or something like that. This is part of our innate view of the universe. Uh, nobody wants to define anything to Darwin's disadvantage. I think you're looking at three scientists here, and I think every one of us has appreciated, and I am speaking only for myself, but I'd be surprised, appreciated the beauty of what Darwin did. It certainly was no joy to conclude that Steve was right. It was no joy for me to, to give up a beautiful theory and one Why that was, it was such a Why good was it beautiful? explanation. Okay. Beautiful is aesthetic, so there's some, some, something subjective about it, but explain that. Why did Darwin strike you as beautiful? Uh, you know, every, uh, each year of my life, I am, I am less convinced that there is anything at all subjective about beauty. Um, oh, really? The fact that here we are in Florence and every single person in the city wants to see the Michelangelo self-portrait I mentioned to you and the slaves in the Academia and the, and, uh, and the great paintings in, in the Uffizi. People come from all over Asia. People come from Africa, they come from all over the world. There's spectacularly little disagreement. I mean, there's disagreement about theorems and, uh, and topology also. When people say, I believe the proof, I don't believe the proof. There's disagreement about everything in human life, but I think less about the greatest art than about any other subject. Beauty is something that I think scientists tend to agree on uh, to use as a pointer in the direction of truth, um, uh, Darwin's theory struck me as beautiful um, insofar as it explains uh, big things by generalizing little things. The, uh, you mentioned the change in the density of fur on a creature with fur, or the shape of the beak of a bird or of a feather of a bird. Um, Darwin can explain those things by principles of natural selection. And when he says, well, we can go from these little changes, a beak is, is, is three inches as opposed to three and a quarter inches, we can use the same mechanism that, by which we explain that to explain why there are sheep and cows, why there are monkeys and also orangutans, and why, the, why apes are different from monkeys. The fact that we can explain this huge question of where species came from the origin of species using the same mechanism that will work for tiny variations in the fur of a sheep or the beak of a 
bird is one aspect of what makes the theory beautiful. I mean, other people look at it from different Just ways. Just quickly, of. because I want to go into the arguments against, but does this, did you have the same response? Does Darwin strike you as beautiful? Never for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen? It was a, a comprehensive synthesis. And so from the standpoint of what scientists look for, it had an, an appeal. It was also well, a well-argued book, The Origin of Species. But it was well argued on the basis of evidence that was known in the 19th century and right. not things that we've learned mostly from the 20th and 21st. OK, we come to that now. Again, from David Galerinter's essay, quote, Darwinian, the fossil record, problem one, the fossil record, Darwinian evolution, I'm quoting you, is gradual step by step. Yet in the Cambrian explosion of around a half a billion years ago, a striking variety of new organisms, including the first ever animals, pop up suddenly in the fossil record over a mere 70 million years, close quote. Now, 70 million years seems to be plenty of time for all kinds of surprising things to this layman. Explain, why is the Cambrian explosion <coughs> such a problem for well, Darwin? Well, the Cambrian explosion was something that- Such a problem that it even began to convince this man. Yeah, you know, it was a problem that even Darwin was aware of, and he wrote about it in The Origin of Species. He said it was inexplicable on his view of, of, of life. Uh, but he, he felt that the, the future fossil finds would fill in the, the, the missing ancestral forms that were evident. What happens in the Cambrian is you get a, a huge number of what are called the uh, animal body plans, uh, where a body plan is a unique configuration of body parts and tissues. And they arrive very abruptly in the fossil record without discernible connection to earlier precursors or earlier ancestors in the pre-Cambrian so record. If, if this wall were the side of a canyon, Halfway up, we'd see... You've, you have a stripe of rock, and in that stripe, you'd find a whole bunch of new forms of, of, of animal life. And that, under, in the layers underneath, there would be no intermediate... There'd be nothing, nothing leading with, to with that. any it discernible connection. Right. right. And so the, the Cambrian explosion itself has been differently dated, but increasingly, the, the, the date that David used of 70 million years is a very generous date for it. The, 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 age, the age range is actually narrowing as a result of additional findings. It's now... About 10 million years is the increasingly accepted date. And there are major explosions. In one Chinese seam, there's 13 to 16 different major groups of animals that have arisen in a 5 to 6 million year window. It's, it's incredibly abrupt geologically when you consider the age of the Earth in the 4.5 billion years. It's also very abrupt biologically because there is a mathematical branch of Darwinian theory called population genetics that allows us to calculate how much, time, how much change, evolutionary change, we ought to expect in a given amount of time if we know things like the mutation rate, the generation time, the right. population sizes. And uh, 5, 10, even 70 million years is a blink of an eye in terms of those, the calculations that can be made for what are called waiting times. And the expected waiting times for the amount of change that's evident in the Cambrian blow out the time scale, if you will. There are hundreds of millions or billions of years. So this is a really unexpected event both biologically, mathematically, and geologically on a Darwinian view of things. All right, back to David Galerinter. We move from the fossil record. I'm coming to you. Go nowhere. I'm patient. Oh, thank you, David. <laughs> David Galerinter, Darwin's main problem is molecular biology. Uh, now, this is complicated to me, but I'm going to continue quoting your essay and then ask somebody to unpack it for this layman here, for this layman who can't tell a cat from a dog apart, the, the, the species. I'm, 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 I'm a, Treat me as a very slow student. Quoting, what, I'm quoting you, what does generating new forms of life entail? Many biologists agree that generating a new shape of protein is the essence of it. Argument step number one, argument step number two. And inventing a new protein means inventing a new gene. You want to give me the, the, the overview on that one? Steve is the real biologist. Right. And I life means new life, new form of life, means new protein, means new gene. Well, I'll, I'll explain it in, in terms that would be familiar to David. If you want to give a computer a new function, write a new program for it to accomplish a new function, you've got to give it new code. And the big discovery of 20th century biology, following Watson and Crick in what's now called the molecular biological revolution, is the same thing is true in life. You want to invent a new form of life, you've got to have, you've got to have code in the form of the information inscribed along the spine of the DNA molecule, and we're learning, and other forms of information. So you need the information to build 
the, the protein molecules that service the, the, the different types of cells, and then you need additional information to arrange the cells into the body plants. And so the, the Cambrian explosion is an explosion of biological form, but it's also an explosion of biological information. And that fact gives us a way of grappling with this question that Darwin didn't have, because we know something about what it takes to generate information in our high-tech digital world of computing. Right. I, know, I have to say that David Galerner, in his essay, goes very easy on Darwin. First, he calls the theory beautiful and says how sad he is to have to dismiss it. And then he says this molecular stuff, Darwin couldn't have known he that. Couldn't Nobody. Have known. So if, tell me if, you tell me if I've got it more or less right. In Darwin's time, it was good enough to imagine that the basic unit of life, a cell, was like a little brick of jello. It was an undifferentiated, quite uncomplicated thing. And you could imagine putting many, many, many of them together and getting different forms of life. Is that roughly fair? Yeah, it was good enough for Darwin. It's probably good enough for us as well, but it's not true. It's not That's true. the big problem. The cell is an unbelievably complex bit of machinery, unfathomably complex. And we haven't understood its complexity at all. Every time we look, there seems to be an additional layer of rebarbative complexity that needs to be factored into our theories. Don't forget, the, the, the eternal goal is to explain the emergence of this complexity. Yes. And if we're continually behind the curve because the complexity is increasing every time we look, that eternal goal is also receding from view, not approaching, it's receding. It's becoming more and more difficult to construct a theory for that. All right, now, somebody give me some notion of the math here. Things are more complicated than Darwin knew. We understand that producing new forms of life now means not just new shapes, new activities in which life engages, but a prior code. Or is that fair? You're the, you're the man who knows uh, code. You know, the, the mathematical element of this, not of population genetics in, in the uh, complex, sophisticated, predictive sense that um, Steve was referring to, but just the simple issue of the code. It is remarkable for young people to learn in high school, it's remarkable for me, or in elementary school, to learn that, that proteins, molecules are assembled because there are codes, there are codes in the nucleus of cells that spell them out, character by character, codon by codon. This codon means this amino acid, and the next one means that, and the next one means that. But the, but the mathematics, the mathematics underlying these codons is very simple. And, there, and Darwin could perfectly well have understood if he had the facts. Each one of these positions has to be occupied by one of 20 amino acids. OK, so you pick one of 20 guys for this position and one of 20 guys for this position. You, you like, talk about visualizing a string of beads. Yeah, like okay. a string as of beads. As you're building a protein. Yeah. Right. So you have building four different colored protein. beads, roughly. I'm, build, I'm building a protein out of amino acids. Yes. And, and I'm doing it by choosing the amino acids one by one by one by one by one. Yes. And I have 20 choices each time. Now, if there are several hundred of these things in the string, in the bead, in the necklace, it's a big ne necklace that wraps around your neck 18 times. So there are several hundred, or five times, whatever it is. That's a huge number of possible choices. The number of ways in which you can arrange the emerald followed by the ruby, followed by the opal, followed by the chunk of platinum, and another ruby, and another ruby, and a diamond, and an aquamarine, the number of ways you can arrange that is huge, grows exponentially. As the, as the string gets longer. So even when the string is short, even if it's a cheap necklace for your very first girlfriend, and it's all you can afford, it's still there's an astronomical number of choices. And Darwin could easily have computed that. He just didn't but know wait, about the amino acids. He didn't know about the necklace. He didn't know about the string. It's not the mathematics that stumped him. It's the biology. The mathematics is simple. A high school student can compute how many choices there are if there are 20 gems for position number one and 20 gems for position number two, and you have 60 gems altogether. And the task here 
Let me. It's 20 to the 60. You're try to mute. So I'm, I'm quoting from your. Even you can. <laughs> even I got it. You got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even to, mathematicians <laughs> can understand. D David, to, da this David yes. Belinsky has a memorable phrase to describe this mathematical problem. He calls it the problem of combinatorial inflation. Yes. Yes. As the yes. length, of, the required length of the protein molecule grows. The numbers grow exponentially. They inflate exponentially. And so the, the, the odds of a random search finding the, 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 the one that makes the pretty necklace, to use the, right. other so David's the, metaphor, the, drop precipitously. And in this huge, unimaginably vast universe of possible combinations, the number of combinations that would produce a useful protein is what? Very Exceedingly rare exceedingly rare. And this is what we didn't know until the last, just the last couple decades. There was an extraordinary conference in the 1960s uh, held by, uh, con convened by a number of MIT scientists, some of whom David knew very well, Murray Eden, Murray Eden Marco, Marco Schussenberger, Mar and uh, they were the first to see the mathematical problem with Darwinism. They called it, the, their conference was called Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. But at the, at the time they could compute the number of possible arrangements, but they didn't know at the time how many of the arrangements would result in functional proteins that would do a job in the cell. And so they didn't know, they couldn't exactly measure how hard the search was, would be on a random, random basis. The, especially the computer scientists, Murray Eden and others, knew that based on computer science, if, if this is functioning like a, a true linguistic system, uh, it's going to be, it's like, uh, unlikely that you can do a random search and find a, meaning, a meaningful string of characters in DNA that will produce a meaningful protein. Okay. But people didn't know in, in the 1960s. By the by early 2000s, there have been a number of different experimental measures of the rarity of the functional genes and proteins versus all the gibberish sequences. Right. And for a short, for, for example, just one result, for a short protein 150 amino acids long, the ratio is one uh, protein that will fold into a, a functional structure for, uh, compared to 10 to the 77th gibberish sequences. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is 1 over 10 to the 77th power. Okay, so functioning proteins are extremely rare. It's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins, except that, and here I quote Dr. Galarenter again, but the theory understands that mutations are rare, and successful ones even scarcer. Darwinism knows this. To balance that out, there are many organisms and a staggering immensity of time. Your chances of winning might be infinitesimal, but if you play the game often enough, you win in the end. Correct? That's the and theory. And that's the question. Do you play it often enough? There's always an often enough, and the question is, does the history of life with which Darwin was concerned uh, allow you enough chances to make it uh, at all probable, let's say, or even possible that you'll hit on, one, statistically, that you'll hit on one of those amazingly rare necklaces that folds up into a protein that can be stuck in a cell and actually doing, doing anything. I'm not a biologist, and so I look at this and say, yeah, there ain't, sure there's enough time. You know, there, there's been a lot of creatures on Earth, and life has gone on for a long time, but when biologists look at this and try and nail it down and figure it out, try and make a guess, try and use heuristics to make a guess, like using the, the number of total bacterial lifetime as a measure of the number of total mutations we're playing with, the point is, from whatever angle you come at it, the, the answer is no, there has not been enough time. The, the, the number of throws we've had is p too puny even to talk about. It doesn't even approach puniness and, and certainly is nowhere near reasonable. So, so we would get that if we had a reasonable no uh, time, but we don't. We didn't. We haven't. So let me just be very explicit from my little Winnie the Pooh bear-sized mind. You are, saying, <laughs> you are saying that Darwin is unlikely to, have, to be able, it's unlikely that species arose the way Darwin said or you are saying it is impossible. Darwin was just mystic. Lovely man, beautiful idea. There's hardly a difference. <laughs> There's hardly a difference. Unlikely, impossible. We're talking about odds that are so prohibitive. If you wish to say it's impossible, fine. I'll defend you saying it's impossible. If you wish to say it's highly unlikely, I'll be in your corner as defense 
attorney as well, but there's no practical difference. It's look, we've known it about just these didn't things for way. hundreds of years. Right? You get a million monkeys at a million typewriters, all of them typing at random. We know they're not going to produce the collected works of Shakespeare in anything like a reasonable amount of time. It's like that wonderful episode of The Simpsons. Do you remember it? Mr. Burns has a million monkeys typing in a million typewriters. <laughs> They're going to produce the greatest novel ever written. He pulls out one sheet of paper and says, it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. <laughs> stupid monkey. <laughs> or to, to put the discussion down even lower, the Jim Carrey film where he's... Uh, uh, trying to get a date with a, a young lady he fancies, and she tells him to go away. He says, well, what are the, what are the odds a, a, a girl like me and a guy like you could get together? You know, not good. And he says, what do you mean, not good? Well, like one in a hundred? And she says, like one in a million. And then he says, well, but if there's a chance. <laughs> so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! <laughs> I read you. Here's a precise way of, uh, of, yes. of, of uh, cashing out this probabilistic argument. If you have 1 over 10 to the 77th power is your ratio, but then you have all, if every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that, about 10 to the 40th organisms. So you define Bacteria, little bacteria, tiny things, and, you know, everything. Every, every mosquito, every, those, every bacterium. Yeah, every time one of those um, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you've got 10 to the 40th possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 77th strong. Right. So if you do your exponential math, you end up with, you can, what it means is you can search 1 10 trillion trillionth, 1 10 trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? You're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations, uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And that's, that, that means that the, the Darwinian hypothesis is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. It just didn't happen. OK, the, one last uh, piece of the argument here that you mentioned. There are other pieces in this book, of course, and in David's book. Um, but here's one last tweet that, that you mentioned in your essay is compelling to you, David Galerner. To help create a brand new, and this is the, the, the question of mut mutations proving harmful at least as often as useful, if I have it right. To help create a brand new form of organism, a mutation must affect a gene that does its job early and in the development of the life form and the, controls the expression of other genes that come into play as the organism grows. Evidently, there are a total of no examples in the literature of mutations that affect early development and the body plan as a whole and are not fatal. Somebody explain that one to me briefly. Uh, who wants to? You, you start and Stephen will. If, um, I'm, if, uh, if I want to direct the assembly of an animal, that I've got to get in there early before they've finished putting them together, putting all the you know the hoofs on and getting the wool on. I've if he's a sheep, I like sheep. I have to say you know I have to get in there early before they start building them, so they don't accidentally build a mouse or a, or a leopard or a, or a zebra. I have to say look, there's going to be sh a sheep get bones this high, and we need a nose about this big, and we need sheep ears, and we need hooves. If sheep have hooves, I think they do. We need wool, you know, get all, get all this stuff together. So I've got to act early. Now, if I'm going to, now if I'm going to create a new species, I'm going to mutate, and instead of building a sheep, I'm going to build a little uh, horse, because horses come in sheep size, what are they called? Well, anyway, they're called. Shetland ponies? Or so, right, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. To do that, I, there may be a mutation that, that makes me order purple wool, or, or the wrong color hooves, or a stomach that won't quite fit. But a mutation that is going to recreate the creature in such a way that it's a different creature is, biologists tell me and farmers tell me, almost certainly likely to be fatal. I mean, a, a, a mutation that makes a huge difference and that starts putting the head on backwards, it starts, starts giving him 17 tails or 
or too many internal organs or forgets the blood or something like that. Because this is right early on that I'm acting when I'm doing tremendously important things. And if I make a slip at this all important stage, I'm not going to make a little error in the density of the fur. It's going to be a big error in the design of the internal and the external that makes this creature what it is. That's, a, that's an informal intuitive explanation. But there's Steve a good, can give you a, a, or a, or a, David can give you a good argumentative disjunction. If you talk about major changes, if they come late in development, they're not going to make a difference. The, the organism is already constructed. It may have Maybe more lavish eyebrows. Or, right, okay. If they come early, they can't make a difference because inevitably they destroy the organism. Too many things downstream depend on those early exactly. cell divisions. Yeah. So we're faced with a real destructive dilemma. Late, no good. Early, no good. Well, when? We've sort of exhausted the, uh, the possibilities. And I'm sure that David Gallerner wants to stick up for Darwin one more time and say he couldn't have known this. <laughs> It, this is not an attack on Darwin as a man or a thinker or a scientist, but it's the job of science to figure out what guesses are right and what are wrong. Scientists are paid for making guesses, not for making right guesses, but for making interesting, plausible ones. And if scientists, after, after the guess has been made, don't do their job, don't investigate the guess, don't do their best to figure out is it true or false, then we are false to science and we're betraying science. Intelligent Design, from David Gallertner's essay. The evidence suggests to Meyer, who's seated with us today, that an intelligent designer must have been responsible. I can't accept intelligent design as Meyer presents it. Close quote. You also have seated next to you David Berlinski, who has been, who is, this is David, who has said, that his attitude toward intelligent design, and I'm quoting him, is warm but distant. It's the same attitude that I display toward my ex-wives. <laughs> so, so you have one man who can't accept it, another man who definitely wants to keep his distance. That leaves Meyer out. So, so well, I don't know, you want to start the easier case? Try to convince David? Tell us what... Tell us what intelligent design is that distinguishes it from some kind of effort to sneak God in by some back door. Sure. Uh, the intelligent design. But, but parenthetically, yeah. just yeah. one word. Yeah. That's definitely not Steve's intention. In, in this book, in intelligent design, it's not a way to bring in a theological argument. It is a scientific approach, purely and absolutely valid scientifically. And one can agree with it or disagree with it. But one doesn't have to reject it insofar as theology making an illegal move, because that's not what he's doing. That's not what you, yeah, good. Let me just sketch the argument sure. briefly, and then we can just discuss it. Um, the, the, the big discovery of the 1950s and 60s was that the DNA molecule encodes information right. in a roughly digital or alphabetic or typographic form. This why, do you, was, why do you use the term digital? Well, because in computer science, we have characters, you know, zeros and ones. I see. I see. This, this, was, this is Crick, 1957, is the sequence hypothesis. He realized that, that the information in DNA, or the, the, the chemical subunits of DNA called nucleotide bases, were functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or like the zeros and ones in a section of computer code. It, that is to say, it's not, it wasn't their chemical properties that gave them their function, but rather their specific arrangement in accord with an independent symbol convention, which was later explicated in the form of what we call the genetic code. So we had genetic text functioning according to a code. So it really As, was a pure, it was, it was pure information. It, it, this is a genuine information storage system. Crick, by the way, was a code breaker in World War II. So this is a fascinating is an application of the information sciences to molecular biology. Now what we, this is, and this is the argument that I make, is that what we know from experience is that information, whether we find it in a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or a information embedded in a radio signal or in a section of computer code, whenever we find information and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And what I do in the book in Darwin's Doubt and in my prior book, Signature in the Cell, is show that these uh, undirected evolutionary mechanisms that have been proposed as an explanation for the origin of information fail for various reasons. We've talked about the reason the Darwinian mechanism fails because it can't search the space when it's so vast. The, the odds are overwhelmingly against it. So if we, if we, from a materialistic evolutionary standpoint, don't have any explanation for the origin of the information that's necessary to build new biological form. And yet we do know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, of a source of information, of a cause 
of the origin of information. That, that cause is intelligence or mind. And so what I've argued in both Darwin's doubt and signature in the cell is that what we're seeing in life is evidence of the activity of a directing mind in the history of life. David Berlinski, to quote the old saying, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. Look around you. There's intelligence behind this creation we inhabit. Yes? That's an easy one for a man like you, yes? I guess. You're not leaving me much to chew with. Um, not much to You are a contrary man. Argument. What do you mean? Well, I don't know. I mean, look, intelligence in the world, intelligence behind the world. Uh, I'm relying on really you to answer like this objection. Whatever he comes up with, you're going to be the one who answers. So get ready. Meanest kisses at famine prices. Uh, it doesn't really in my point, from my point of view, it doesn't really give us much. It's not yet a theory. I'm certainly prepared oh, to say I there's see. a lot of intelligence manifest in the world, but at the same time, I think that doesn't really Oh, it's a tautology to you. It's we, not a tautology. Well, look at this, it's information. Yes, it's information. Uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, it's information. I recognize that. Information in some loose sense, maybe Shannon's sense, maybe a, a more elegant formulation of information theory, but uh, I'm much more persuaded by something that leads to a strong counterintuitive claim. For example, that the information is embedded in a topology in a certain way that makes it inevitable that certain life forms will emerge. That would be an interesting conclusion. And for a time, I thought there was such a, uh, a mathematical construction. I don't think my confidence was entirely well-founded, but it was a good idea. But just to say that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. I could have said that before thinking about biology. It is. That's true. David Galerinkner, I'm quoting your essay again. If there was an intelligent designer, what was his strategy? How did he manage to back himself into so many corners, wasting energy on so many doomed organisms? What was his purpose? And why did he do such a slip sh slipshod job? Why are we so disease prone, heartbreak prone, and so on, close quote. But aren't you setting a pretty high stand? Aren't you saying, in effect, Either Stephen Meyer can explain all the mysteries of the human heart, or he's not allowed to say anything. That is to say, the difference between a purely materialistic view, that all that we see around us came about purely as a matter of chance, and Stephen's view that there is intelligence, however little we can say about it, however little we understand what we mean by that, that's still a fundamental finding. Uh, the question is whether the world around us that you're pointing at meets your standard of intelligence. Whether, whether the design that we see is in fact an intelligent design or a total mess. When I look at the world at large, I see a mess. When I look at the mind of man, I see a worse mess. I see a, a creature uh, as likely to do bad as good or more likely. Um, I see um, many creatures who are who are fated to die out without uh, leaving any contribution that we can associate with value, not even becoming oil or something like that. I don't look at I don't look at the world as we know it as more likely the result of intelligence than random playing around, than just random taking your chances. I think if you took your chances, you you'd come up with a mess like the world. You'd, you'd, you'd have some lucky breaks. There's some really great people. There's some beautiful cities like Florence. There are all sorts Michelangelo of wonderful things. Michelangelo down in the valley, See? right? There are wonderful things. But on the whole, I would fail this world if I were grading it. I, and this is an important point in the Talmud, by the way. I won't make this. There's a famous argument between Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, two schools of thought who, are, uh, who uh, lived at the same time, famous for disagreeing about everything. One of them was a lot like David. But, uh, and, but there's, only one, there's only one question on which they ever agreed. And that question was, uh, is it good that the Earth was created? Is it good that the universe was created? Is it, is it, is it, is it good that it happened? Um, and Hillel says, and Shammai agrees with him, no, it was a catastrophe. If we had to go back and do it all again, we'd have to tell uh, the Almighty, don't do it. The suffering outweighs the good. Wow. 
Oh, all right. Stephen? So if it's intelligent design, it wasn't that intelligent. Um, I look at it a little differently. I see two things when I look at nature. I see evidence of design, or aboriginal design. Aboriginal and, meaning? From the beginning, you know, ah, in, right. different, in different groups of organisms. From but, the get-go. But you also see evidence of decay. And that's also something that's consistent with what, de when designers make things, then there's we, this thing we call entropy. And I think here a theological perspective does help, because I think you, if, uh, from the Judeo-Christian perspective, you would expect to see both evidence of, of original creation or original design, but you would also expect to see that something's gone wrong in nature as well. Yes. And I think we see both. So my, my theological perspective does inform my ability to answer that question about the things in nature that don't look so well. Uh, it's interesting, uh, for example, the problem of virulent uh, bacteria, you know, nasty, nasty bugs. They are, the, the, they're, they are invariably the result of a loss of information as a result of the mutational process. So the very process that the Darwinists have invoked to explain the origin of good design is actually, I think, responsible for the, the evidence of decay. So I think there is a, there, this is the question in uh, philosophy known as the theodicy. You know, the, yes, the, yes, yeah. the problem with pain. And so I, I think there's ways of thinking about that. But, I, but, but for me, the, the evidence of design is powerful. It's ubiquitous in, in both in life and at the level of physics of things like the fine tuning of the laws and constants of physics. So I, I see a very powerful signal of design, but I don't deny the decay and the suffering in the world. And I, I have a theological way of understanding if that. The, if the, if the, the bad viruses are always a result of a defect, that fits the theology perfectly. Which the theology suggests that good is the entity Evil has no independent existence. It's always a defect or a shortcoming in the good, right? Isn't that right? I think it does fit. And, okay. and there's well, back, quite a lot of microbiology that actually supports that, that viewpoint. But back to you, Dr. Gelerentner. What are two of the great Jewish minds in history doing saying that creation is bad when the beginning of the Hebrew scripture is God saw that it was good? Um, We're departing from Darwin just a bit, but I can't resist, <laughs> I can't resist that one. It's, it's absolutely true that, uh, that he saw that it was good, and both of the two creation stories agree that the, that, that the world is a good thing, and yet immediately, as far as the Bible is concerned, men start screwing it up. From, yes. uh, from Adam and Eve, um, to Cain and Abel, to Noah and his ark, to the stories of the patriarchs and the, and the world in which they lived, to uh, Moses, who, who leads Israel to the promised land, and the people are a bitch. They're constantly fighting, arguing, struggling, being a nuisance in every conceivable way. So it, it, God creates a perfect world. On the other hand, he hasn't created a perfect creature. That's why we are obligated to study and struggle, study the good and try to struggle in that direction. But I, you know, I wanna say, I, I have no theological argument with, with Steve. What I, my argument is with people who dismiss uh, intelligent design without considering it, it seems to me, it's widely dismissed in my world of academia as some sort of theological put-up job. It's an absolutely serious scientific argument. In fact, it's the first and most obvious and intuitive one that comes to mind. It's got to be dealt with intellectually, not not by the bigotry, the anti-religious bigotry, which is one of the most important facts of the intellectual world in the United States, in the West generally today. The, 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 case, yeah, the case for intelligent design is not based on, uh, you know, we, we can have a theological discussion as we've had a bit here, but the case for intelligent design isn't a, an interpretation or a deduction from the scriptural text. Right. It's an inference from biological evidence. And, right. and in, that, in that sense, it's different. And and he makes the, that assertion. And you say, yep, he's being honest about that. And anybody can check. Not only that, but I think it's an important assertion because uh, outside the scientific world, one might not know how ideologically uh, bent the world of science, parts of the world of science are becoming. I, I say it with real sorrow, and it's certainly not true of every scientist or even of most scientists, but we have a cautionary tale in what happened to our English departments and our history departments it could happen to us. All right, God you're, you're forbid, setting but... up my, 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 sort of my last round of questions here. I'm going to quote you once again, David Gelerentner. Darwinism is no longer just a scientific theory, but the basis of a worldview 
and an emergency religion for the many troubled souls who need one, close quote. Now, lots of people have invested lots of energy in discrediting Dr. Berlinski and Dr. Meyer over the years. You, Dr. Galerntner, are a professor of unquestioned competence and achievement in computer science. And computer science is with it, baby. It is right at the middle of the new world we're creating. It's technocracy. We don't have to ask ultimate questions. We just have to deal with zeros and ones. It's totally rational. It's producing a cornucopia of new wealth. And now Galerntner goes over to the other side He's so, been with us all along. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's the reception been, been traitor. at New Haven and, and in your profession, in academia? I mean, that's uh, a serious question. What's going yeah, on? Okay. I, um, I have to make a distinction between the, the way I've been treated personally, which is in a very courteous and collegial way by my colleagues at Yale. They're nice guys, and I like them. They're, they're my friends. On the other hand, when I look at, at their intellectual behavior, what they publish, and much more important, what they tell their students, um, Darwinism has indeed passed beyond a scientific argument as far as they are concerned. You take your life in your hands to challenge it intellectually. Yes. They will destroy you if you challenge it. Now, I haven't been destroyed. I'm not a biologist, and you know I don't claim to be an authority on this topic. But... Um, and, you know, a book review is not the same as a book. It's, to, it's to sort of a satellite around the book. A anyway, it remains a case that I have nothing personally to charge my colleagues with. But what I've seen in their behavior intellectually and at colleges across the West is nothing approaching free speech on this topic, is a bitter rejection, not just a, a, a sort of a bitter fundamental uh, angry, outraged, violent rejection, which comes nowhere near scientific or intellectual discussion. I've seen that happen again and again. I'm a Darwinism. Don't you say a word against it or we'll, or I don't want to hear you, period. Which proves that you're attacking their religion, in effect. I am attacking their religion. religion, and I don't blame them for being all head up. It is a big issue for them, unquestionably. Dr. Berlinski, who holds his doctorate in philosophy, I want to depart, this isn't strictly Darwin, but it's a, I'm indulging myself. This is a quotation that has struck me as compelling for a long time, but for a long time I've thought I really want to try it on Berlinski. So here we go. Okay, try, I'll try you. This is C.S. Lewis. Granted that reason is prior to matter, I can understand how men should come to know a lot about the universe they live in. If, on the other hand, I swallow the scientific cosmology, and for scientific cosmology, we may as well read the Darwinian theory of evolution. If I swallow the scientific co cosmology, then not only can I not fit in religion, but I cannot even fit in science. Here we go. Here's the, here's the payoff on this. If minds are wholly dependent on brains, and brains on biochemistry, and biochemistry on the meaningless flux of the atoms, I cannot understand how the thought of those minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees." Close quote. He's on to something there, isn't he? Isn't the existence of, isn't consciousness the first question we have to answer? Not mine. Totally wrong, just. It's not even the first question I would think of asking. <laughs> Why does it seem so very compelling to you or C.S. Lewis? Consciousness, if, yeah, it's one of those things. It's certainly true that I'm conscious. I have my doubts about you and, and these two guys here, but those doubts really don't matter a whole lot. I'm prepared to welcome my friends as automata. It doesn't he, matter to me. He, he's, 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 he's not onto a point or he's onto something that's just uninteresting? I, I'm not sure I understand the point. I mean, let's say... Does this make any sense to you? It makes sense to me. This, yeah. was, this is what bothered Thomas Nagel and, and why yeah. he's become a skeptic of, of neo-Darwinism is that minds are real things. And if you can't give an account of where they came from or what they do that isn't itself self-defeating, then you end up uh, in, a, in a really incoherent Okay, to, to Galerner to break the tie because his latest book was on consciousness. I, uh, 
I have to agree. I am an, also an admirer of Nagel. And, and the question of consciousness is unsolved. Um, you, you can argue whether it's important or not. I think, I think most people intuitively believe it's important. I think they're right. But the, the question of the origins of life and the origins of consciousness are the intellectual bookends of modern science and philosophy. And um, we can't say much about either of them. We can't characterize either of them. And if we can't characterize them, we're not really in a position to explain how they emerged. That seems to me a prior commitment to be able to say what we wish to explain. Now, someone says, I'm deeply puzzled about consciousness. I mean, everybody says that. It's a very fashionable thing. They say it in teen vogue, for heaven's sakes. But I would like to have a better sense of what is prompting the puzzlement. I don't have that. I can't sit in your seat when you're sitting there, so I can't experience your sensations when you're having them. Well, all right, so what? Why is that intelligible from a scientific or a philosophical point of view as a pressing issue? If, if you say most of your friends happen to be automata, uh, we'll turn you into an automata and you'll get a $50 coupon right now where you can spend in Florence. Would you accept the deal or not? 50 bucks for yeah. my consciousness? Yeah, for you Bist becoming an autom automata. Excuse me. No, you're bis du well, look, you <laughs> Oh, but now you're just dickering over right? the price. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. But yeah. that's true of all intellectual discussions. We're always talking yeah, about right. the price. The price seems to me very low to be puzzled. There are lots of things that are puzzling in the world. <laughs> Some of them we understand, some of them we don't. But uh, before you value you, your consciousness at least at fifty dollars. Yeah, fifty dollars for my consciousness. At least you've established a floor. <laughs> we can go up from there. I think we're all saying it's a mystery, but we're framing the mystery in different That's terms. That's exactly right. right. It's right. a puzzle. I don't even. I'm not even persuaded it's a mystery in the sense which the structure of a natural language. But is whatever a it is, it's valuable to you. To me, maybe not to you. Okay. Just as yours is valuable to you, but not. Entirely to me. But, this is, this but we is have to be very skeptical about these claims of profundity because when examined, they don't always remain what they seem. Right. They don't always remain that. Gentlemen, let me name three names that all but remade modern consciousness. I think the three of you would agree with that formulation when you hear the names. 19th and early 20th century. Karl Marx, no longer taken seriously. I, a few faculty lounges in American universities. Fundamentally, Karl Marx, no longer taken seriously. Sigmund Freud, fascinating, a few interesting insights, but psychology has now moved so far beyond Freud that at universities across the country, they're renaming the departments, the departments of psychology and brain sciences. We're scanning brains, we, all right. And now we have Darwin, and the three of you are taking him down, too. What does this mean for the way people think about the world? Is this, he won't go down easily. No one has taken down Freud. His value oh, really? doubles I'm, every decade. I'm with David. Oh, I'm you are? Wrong. I'm just oh, wrong about Freud that. Freud rises in my estimation. Oh, he does? Yeah, the fact oh, is yeah. that the feminists in the 1970s were outraged because of something he said or didn't say in a political way it has nothing to do with the value Writing. But I'm right at two out of three, Marx and Darwin? Certainly with Marx and Darwin. Marx is kind of a windbag. Let, let's agree on that. Um, <laughs> kind of bastard, personally. Yeah, he didn't bathe a whole lot. A windbag <laughs> and a bastard. In and he bad. certainly had no sense of style. Darwin is a different case. I think you're onto something to, to group them together because um, you've talked about how Darwinism, David talked about how Darwinism has become the foundation of a worldview. And if you yes. look at the questions that they address, uh, Marx, uh, Darwin tells us where we came from. Uh, Marx has a utopian vision of the future. And Freud tells us what to do about our guilt. And between the three of these great materialistic thinkers of the 19th century and early 20th century, they form a, the basis of a kind of comprehensive materialistic worldview. They answer all the same questions that traditional Judeo-Christian religion has addressed. And so it's uh, understandable when we're talking about some of the, the uh, intense opposition that uh, Darwin skeptics often face, 
that it, it, it's understandable when you realize that you actually, it makes sense because you're challenging a fundamental plank in the worldview of, of many of the scientists. Many scientists equate their worldview of scientific materialism with the practice of science itself. And when you challenge one of the thinkers that, has, that supports that worldview, you're going to get a, a, a very kind of emotive reaction, and that's often what happens. Last question here, and I'm going to quote David Galerichner's essay one final time. Darwin now poses a final challenge, whether biology will rise to this last one as well as it did to the first when his theory upset every apple cart remains to be seen. How cleanly and quickly can the field get over Darwin and move on? Striking sentence. This is one of the most important questions facing science in the 21st century, close quote. Is it generational? Does a whole generation of biologists have to die before the field gets over Darwin? What's going to happen here? Might be generational at the very best. At I the mean, best. I, th I think that would be a great outcome, to have the old guard die. And, and new, but, but you know, religion is imparted uh, more than anything else by the parents to the children. And, and, and the young people have been brought up as little Darwinists. I mean, kids I see running around New Haven are all Darwinists. Anyway, the children, I mean the students in my class are all Darwinists. So I, these guys know more about it than I do. I'm not hopeful. Well, I think Darwin is eternal. Because it's eternal. Eternal. The name is eternal. The idea is eternal. The belief, the commitment, they're all eternal. The theory will disappear. In good riddance to a bad theory. But no matter me, what... It's a beautiful theory. All right, it's a beautiful theory. Whatever it is, it will disappear. But whatever replaces it will be called Darwinian. No doubt about that. No matter what Christian heresy emerges in the tides of time, it's always called a Christian heresy. This will be a Darwinian heresy. But that legacy, that commemorative legacy, will never disappear. It's part of the history of the subject. Just like Newton will not disappear. Oh, but Newton, oh, David Galerner, see, I'm prepared for that one because I read David Galerner's essay very carefully. <laughs> and, but, and of course, he based on your work and your work. Several but times. As, as, as this David says, look, there's a range of physical phenomena, very big things, planets, stars. Newton isn't too good at that. Very tiny things, quantum mechanics, tiny particles we can't see. He's not too good at that. But this huge range, dark, Newton is perfectly predictive. It fits, it comports flawlessly with 98% with of human experience. That, that's true. And Darwin doesn't. You have to go farther. Planets and stars. Oh, I do. But, yeah, but you're. Right. I think. I think what David Berlinski is getting at is that Darwin, help Darwinism has filled an, a niche in our intellectual life that is necessary. You've got to have, give some kind of account of the, where all these wonderfully uh, intricate systems we call living organisms came from, and the fundamental commitment of Darwinism is to some kind of bottom-up materialistic account where the molecules get more complex and form. Molecule, more complex molecules and cells, and the cells uh, compete to form more complex organisms. So now what we're getting is post-neo-Darwinian theories of evolution that are trying to uh, provide new mechanisms that will uh, account for the, 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 the things that the Darwinian mechanism doesn't account for. So even you, who bear the scars of abuse from Darwinists, say... Darwin may have been mistaken in his answers, but he was asking invaluable questions. He's asking invaluable questions, but I think he got it wrong. I think all Darwinians, in the broad sense, get it wrong. They're trying to explain something very, very complex in terms of bottom-up, undirected processes. And we, yet what we see in life, uh, complex miniature machines, complex information processing systems, digital code, these are things that bear the hallmark of mind. And they suggest rather a top-down instead of a bottom-up approach. So I'm sure people committed to a materialistic view of things will continue to, to generate bottom-up explanations. But I think we're in a new day. We're looking at life in light of our own high-tech digital computing uh, technologies and realizing it bears, these systems bear all the hallmarks of design. Let's start to look at life differently. And I think looking at it from a bottom-up Darwinian approach is holding science back. We're starting to make predictions based on intelligent design we were some, some of our guys were the first people to predict that the non-coding regions of the genome, previously identified as junk by the neo-Darwinians, have in fact 
uh, are in fact importantly functional. And so there's the, looking at life as a design system is actually yielding insights into how life works. It's a new day? You'll go with that? Yeah, sort of. It, it, there's been sort of. big changes, let's put it this way. I think what we have determined is that Darwin created a 19th century local theory without looking at extreme cases that was reasonably successful for breeders for the explanation of local characteristics like beak size or the growth of wings, but he entirely failed to explain what he thought he was explaining, the emergence of biological complexity on the species level or higher order levels. He wasn't able, it was a premature question to address an audience about the origin of species. He couldn't say anything about what he did not know, what he could not comprehend. And the fact that he did not know or could not comprehend these things is simply a reflection of the fact that we do not know or cannot comprehend those things in the 21st century. So the question was, the question addressed was widely premature in the 19th century. It's still premature. We're just learning the structure of intellectual inquiry necessary to understand something like the biological cell. And it's much harder a problem than we ever suspected. Much harder. David Galerner, last word to you. Do you concur? It is much harder. Yeah, absolutely, it's a fantastically difficult problem. We'll solve it, but it's not going to be simple. David Galantner, author most recently of The Tides of Consciousness. Thank you. David Berlinski, author of many books, all three of you, author of many books, but author, in this case, the relevant volume is The Deniable Darwin and Other Essays, and Steve Meyer, who's book. In this case, the relevant book is Darwin's Doubt. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to my friends. Yeah. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.